Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second to last DSS event of the 2013-2014 academic year. Our guest is currently a professor of public service at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, co-director for the Center for Public Leadership, and a senior political analyst for CNN. In addition to these roles, our guest is also author of the New York Times bestseller, Eyewitness to Power, and a veteran of the US Navy, where he served for three and a half years. A little on our speaker's background. Our guest was born right here in Durham, North Carolina, to the chair of the mathematics department at Duke, John Gergen, and his wife, Aubin. After completing his undergraduate education at Yale, where he graduated with honors, and his time at Harvard Law School, our guest began his career in the White House as a staff assistant. He quickly made his way up the ranks and became director of speech writing in only two years. Since then, our guest has worked with several presidents and has been awarded 25 honorary degrees and has been on teams that have been awarded two Peabody Awards. More importantly, he taught here at Duke from 1995 to 1999 before going to the dark side at Harvard. <laughs> However, we will forgive him since his son Christopher, who's in the audience today, is currently an entrepreneur in the Durham community and a professor here at Duke. He went to Duke undergrad. Our speaker has been a board member at Duke and several other nonprofits, including City Year and Teach for America, and an advisor to Duke Engage and the North American Executive Committee, among other organizations. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to welcome, back, to welcome our guest back home to Durham and to Duke. Please join me in welcoming our guest, David Gergen. So David, welcome home. Thank you. Uh, Good to be here. Yes. Uh, we are all incredibly lucky to, to have David with us. David is clearly the expert in the world on presidential leadership, having worked up, up close and, and personal with a number of presidents. And he's also looked at presidential elections through the eyes of, of uh, a media, various media roles. And so he has a lot of insights into leadership overall. We'll probably focus mainly on the political arena, but uh, I think everything is fair game once I have finished with my questions and turn it over to, to people in the audience. Um, so, so let's be clear. Some people go in life, go from mountaintop to mountaintop, right? In government, I went from Watergate to Whitewater. I went from, I went from valley to valley. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, <laughs> so I, I'm going to apologize in advance. I was I was in India last night, um, so if I seem a little slow, um, <laughs> and and actually I find that it, it's very convenient when you're matching wits with someone who is much smarter than than uh, oneself to have a, a ready-made well, excuse. There's, you know, there's, um, a, there's a quality that we're a li little bit like India, and they say that in in China, business succeeds because of government, and in India, business succeeds despite government. And we're increasingly like India. So you're right at home here, coming talking about government. <laughs> OK, so let's, let's go back yeah. to uh, <laughs> let's go back to Durham. So you, you are a Durham native. You, yeah. you graduated from a, a Durham, actually Durham High, which Durham is High now School. Durham School of the Arts. And my question is, how important was it growing up in Durham in shaping the person that you became? I think it was enormously important growing up in a smaller community in, in, in those days. And I, I had the a privilege, I, I did a really good job selecting my parents. And, uh, uh, and so I had wonderful parents and a, and a close knit household, and I was the youngest of uh, four boys. And my dad was here on the uh, math faculty, as you just heard, he was chairman of the department. Uh, and he made it very clear to me early in life that I should find another line of work. Um, which was also very helpful. Uh, but this was a, um, Durham then was a small town. It is still a relatively small town. I think it's a much more innovative town today. I learned this through my son Christopher. Christopher, why don't you stand up so people can see who, uh, who you, uh, he's here and you'll, if you've got any hard questions, direct them at him. Um, but um, this was a, uh, you know, I grew up in the, in the shadow of the university. I learned to swim over here at the, uh, at the university, and my first job was sort of selling Coca-Cola and peanuts in the Duke Stadium way back when. I'd carry them up and down the aisles, and um, uh, I was a bat boy for the Duke baseball team. 
I think that was at a time when Dick Grote was playing. Uh -huh. It was back, he, I, was, I was young, I was about 10 or 12 years old, and they had some first class athletes. And at, at that time, you could actually go over to the Cameron Stadium, and we did with kids, and the, and the basketball, uh, uh, behind, the, behind the, the, uh, the hoop was, the, was webbing, you know, there was a big heavy webbing. And as kids, you could actually go down and sit inside that webbing. You know, like three of us used to go down and watch the basketball games. And you could see Lenny Rosenbluth or somebody like that coming roaring down the court. And it was a, that was a wonderful experience. So there was a feeling, um, I think, that what matters in life in part for leaders is if you, if you have a happy childhood. If there's a lot about it that, you know, that makes you feel embraced and loved by your parents and loved by your community, then it wasn't always easy. And, you know, there were parts of it that were... Uh, that were, had the dark side to them, as you say. I, we lived on a, you know, Eisenhower said, President Eisenhower once said that uh, he grew up poor, but he never knew it until he was older. Um, and uh, we grew up in relatively, not, not impoverished, I lived on a dirt road, and, uh, and, uh, but across the road from us is this great big old house uh, that was up in the trees, and there were these two crazy ladies who, who lived in this house, the Mangum sisters, and they, they had guns, and they'd shoot them. At, they'd shoot them at night, and to, and to go up and, and to catch the bus to go to a movie downtown. Movies that days were nine cents, and to go catch a bus, I had to go walk through this path up through the past the Mangum sisters' house, and they'd hide behind a tree and jump out at you. And <laughs> and, uh, and uh, we uh, all the little boys in our neighborhood. They, I got organized by my older brothers. We one day we got a uh, we all got together and decided we had got our, we got our BB guns and we got our uh, bows and arrows and everything, you know, got our slingshots. And we surrounded this house where the Mangum sisters lived. And uh, upon a signal, we charged. And, and they came running out and screaming and they had their guns and one thing and another. And the next day, my, the cops were on my front doorstep at nine o'clock in the morning. They had a police car out on my front doorstep. My parents get raised hell with me. But it was the Mangum sisters they eventually, I don't know, I think they went a little nuts eventually. They were mostly nuts when I knew them. Um, but they've turned that into a restaurant. Yeah. Four Square. Huh? What's the name of that? Four Square. Four Square. Uh -huh. It's the name of the restaurant. Uh, and so there, there, I had goblins in the night in my, my childhood. But it was, uh, I look back upon the Durham you know, being raised in this community as being, uh, you know, I just feel very, very privileged and fortunate that I came from here. And, you know, when I, when I first left Durham, I thought, you know, it's sort of a backwater place and whoever knows anything about it. And I went north to school and everybody sort of looked down at you because you were Southern and you talk slow. And, you know, you just, you, that, if you talk slow, that obviously meant you weren't very smart. And, and there was a lot of sort of, um, um, well, I'm from this small town. But, you know, I've gotten to be very proud of being from Durham. It's, it's, a, it's a badge of honor to me to come from North Carolina now. I think this is a terrific state into which to raise children. Yeah. So Juan, Juan mentioned that, that you left Durham, you went to Yale, then, then uh, to Harvard Law School, then the Navy. Uh, so you're, after you got out of the Navy, um, you, you went to, to work for Nixon. But the, the question I had is, why, why did you go into the Navy instead of practicing law? And in fact, uh, I believe that it was the first time that you met Nixon that he advised you, if you were going to go in the Navy, take a, take a, a line, line position as opposed yeah. to a staff role as a yeah. lawyer, yeah. Um, and you, you ended up going into damage control, um, <laughs> exactly. which apparently good was, preparation for yes, government. good preparation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, so why, why did you go in the Navy instead of uh, practicing Well, the, uh, there was a war on. The, the Vietnam War was underway, and there was a draft. And uh, in those days, and I think it's still true, but. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom Wolfe, the novelist, used to write about this. You know, there's a tradition in the South that, that uh, if you're called, you serve. Uh, and so you find a disproportionate number of people who signed up in the military during the Vietnam War were from the South. Uh, uh, and uh, it, a lot of the rural South, but it was sort of, I came from a place, you know, a community that sort of you were expected. If, you were, if, if it was out there, you were expected to go. So, you know, the truth was I had a lot of classmates who did not. And you could duck out of it. If you, you know, if you got some girl pregnant, you could get out of the draft in those days. 
and a lot of guys did. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, was, I, it seemed to be, and so not very many people from my law school class went in the Navy, and, uh, and so when I went in, I wasn't sure if I was gonna practice law when I got, when I got out, and I didn't know quite what I was gonna do, I still don't. Um, and, uh, but I thought for sure, Bill, that, that all my classmates would streak ahead of me. I'd be in, I was gonna go in for three and a half years, and I felt for sure there'll be three and a half years ahead of me. They'll all be out there, you know, they'll be halfway to partnership, and I'll be out here struggling, and one thing and another. And uh, this will all be very irrelevant. Well, two things happened. One was when I got out, I met most of my classmates were terribly disillusioned practicing law. And that really helped to convince me, I don't think I want to do this either. And uh, it was, I, I, I love the study of law. It was actually intellectually one of the most exciting things I've ever done because you're so much on your own in, in studying law. You've got to take the cases home. You, don't, you, you learn in preparation for class, not in class, in, in law school. And, uh, and I found it just terribly stimulating, but I hated the practice of law. Now, I know people who feel the other way about business. They, uh, you know, I know I've, I've got friends in New York, big financial guys now, who say, I didn't really like business school all that much, but I love practicing business. Well, I, I was the other way around coming out of law school. So one thing was it really helped confirm my early biases. I don't think I want to practice. I, and a big commercial firm. I just didn't, you know, having two insurance companies sue each other and having spent lots and lots of time in libraries working and worried about how the law is ever applied, who the hell cares who wins? I mean, what difference does it make in the, in the long-range in long scheme of things? Um, but the other thing was that the Navy was a good learning experience for me. Uh, you know, I asked a lot of lawyers before I went in, should I go into JAG, which is the Judge Advocate General's Corps, the, the legal corps, or should I go into what's called straight line, which would be a line officer? And almost to a person, they said, go, go be a line officer. You'll have leadership experience. You'll have, and it was true. I came out of two you know, elite schools in, at Yale undergrad and Harvard Law. And you're sort of up in a tower. You know? You're up there with this, this sort of crowd that, that doesn't really sort of understand what's going on down in the trenches very well sometimes. And coming out of law school, and within two months, I was at OCS, Officer Candidate School, and I was cleaning latrines with a toothbrush. Literally, that was part of my job. That's what you had, they, they broke you in that way. But taking responsibility, I had 50 young men who were, I was responsible for in, in the engineering division, in damage control division. And they were almost all guys who had maybe finished high school, probably hadn't, had drug problems, had women problems, had. In, they had financial problems. They had a lot of problems in life, but they knew one heck of a lot more about what they were doing than I did. I mean, I was a complete klutz at engineering. I mean, I didn't know the difference between a, bolt, a nut and a screw, and I still really don't, you know. I, I really, you know, this kind of stuff does not come easily, but I was great at holding a flashlight uh, while they did the work. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I learned so much about leadership by having to deal with 50 guys I'd never met before, came from very different backgrounds, and you had to sort of serve as, how do you inspire them, how do you, how do you mobilize them, how do you persuade them to do the work, showing them the respect for them that they deserved, and at the same time, not allowing them to slack off too much, because you gotta get the work done. And how do we build a team? How do we build a unit? How do we build something that actually is effective? You know, we had to fight fires, we also had to do the plumbing, and a lot of other stuff. Um, it was not always pretty, but, but I got a lot out of that. And uh, when I left, they gave, the, the enlisted guys gave me a big party. They gave us a, you know, a lot of things, which, it wasn't, which was unusual for enlisted people to do that. And so I was, I was um, it was one of the best experiences I've had. It was, I, I, two really good growing experiences for me. One was the Navy, and the other was actually back here in North Carolina while I was in college. And Terry Sanford was elected governor, and he's, you know, as you know, the Sanford School is named after Terry, and he became, he and Joel Fleischman, that name may be familiar to some of you, uh, were sort of mentors of mine, and, and I got to know Terry pretty well, but they persuaded me to come be an intern in state government, which I did, and I wound up working for Terry on civil rights for three summers. And it was at the time when the civil rights, this was before I went in the, before I went in the Navy, I went to law school. And, Working on civil rights here and trying to advance the opportunities for African-Americans, Negroes, as people were called then, 
uh, in education and jobs. Um, I, I, I put a lot of time into service, public service in Washington, D.C. The most satisfying time I've ever had in public service was here in North Carolina. Hmm. It was actually more deeply satisfying to me as a way of con contributing than what I did in Washington. So you went from one of the most satisfying uh, times of, of your kind of development to the valley of Watergate, what ultimately became Watergate. And when you, when you reflect on your, your time working with Nixon, it, it's very interesting that, that you, you paint a, a very balanced portrait of Nixon, um, where most people just want to say he was pure evil. You recognize that he was deeply flawed. He was impure evil. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, he, so he had his issues, uh, certainly, but you also felt he was absolutely brilliant and, and one of the best strategists yeah. that we've, ever, that we've yeah. ever had as president. Um, he's certainly, uh, if you look at Duke alumni, he is certainly the, the most famous and revered Duke alum in China today, given what he did with China. So the, the question is, you, you talked about Terry Sanford. Terry Sanford wanted to bring the Nixon Library to Duke. And then the Duke faculty got upset about that and said, no, do you think, do you think Duke made a mistake in turning away that library? Well, I think if, it, if the question arose now, the, the faculty would accept it. Uh, but at the time, the passions were such, it's understandable that the faculty would be very, very divided about it. Um, I would note that uh, you know, the George W. Bush Library has gone now to uh, the Southern Methodist University, SMU in Dallas. It was controversial with the faculty, uh, but now that it's built, it seemed to be a very popular place. And I, th I think that's where they had just had that big, no, that was down at the, at the Father's Place at A&M, um, this portraiture thing. But let me just say a word more about, about Nixon, uh, two things. Um, I grew up because coming in a, from a university family, the emphasis in the family and the, the judgment by which people, or, uh, you're measured in to a significant degree in my family life by how smart you were, by, by the cognitive capacity. That's what sort of, there's, there's a lot of emphasis placed on that in universities, right? I mean, to get into undergrad life, you've got to have the right scores uh, to get in. Um, and so I always thought growing up that the best leader would be the, the smartest person in the group. If you just figure out who's the smartest person, th you'll get the best results. Uh, and then I worked for Nixon. Um, and, 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 and I've learned with him and with other people that being bright is, is, or being competent is the threshold requirement. That's, what, that's the basic bottom line. You, you've got to meet, you've got to pass the threshold and in order to be uh, a leader, we, we, you and I were talking about this a little while ago, um, but that there are other qualities that are required as well to be a complete leader. And if you're just bright, that's not sufficient. It's, it, it's helpful, but it's not sufficient. And uh, I've discovered the two other qualities that, uh, which are, I believe, very, very important, is you need a lot of drive. You need, to, you need to have a vision and a lot of, but a lot of drive to get where you're going because leadership is about change. And change is never easy. Go back and read Machiavelli, who said change is always hard because the people who are, there are some people, the, stat, the people who, uh, who benefit from the status quo are going to oppose you automatically because they, they live well and with the status quo. And the people who are actually gonna benefit from change are gonna be fearful. They're, they're, not, they're not going to be quite ready to accept it's going to happen. It's really tough. Hard change is really, and big change is really, really hard. And that means you've got to have, you've got to have the capacity, the fire inside, the, the drive to help lift people there uh, and to get the organization there. And you've got to wake up every day, you know, thinking about how we're going to get, get a little farther along, how we're going to keep going toward our goals. So that's a second quality that I think is universal across time, across cultures. But there is this third quality, which is not emphasized enough, and that it was, came home very clearly with, with uh, Richard Nixon, and that was the, the importance of character, and the, the, and the qualities that go with character, the temperament that goes with leadership, the personal inner qualities, I think are the, 
these are the hardest things to, to uh, develop. They are the soft skills are the hardest things to develop. Um, and I think you need to go through a, a personal journey to acquire character. I think this is something that you work on over time, you build it up over time. But you know what we know about leadership today and how it's changed from what it, what it was, for hundreds and hundreds of years, leadership was about you know, ordering from the top down. About, and if, in effect, if you do this or if you don't, I'm gonna threaten you with some sort of punishment, maybe even death. Uh, but it was very, very much top down command and control and for centuries, and now of course we've moved to this new model of leadership, which is about influence, and influencing people to do things, persuading them to do things. You don't have the general patents anymore. Uh, uh, that, that, that form of leadership has just disappeared. But now if you're going to persuade people to do that, they have to trust you. And to get their trust, you've got to have character. They need to know that you're transparent, that you're telling them, that you're, that you're telling them the truth for starters. Secondly, they need to know when you say something, you really know what you're talking about. They trust you, your competence. And they really need to know, if you tell them something today, it's not gonna to change tomorrow. So that there's a consistency across time and they can then invest themselves and put themselves on the line to follow you. And, and, and Nixon, you know, clearly was a, uh, he, he, was, he, he was brilliant in many ways. When I first met him, I thought, wow, this guy's really impressive. He was, remains the best strategist I've ever met. A guy who could literally go up on a mountaintop and look out in, uh, into the future 20 or 30 years and, and, and figure out how history was about to unfold and then nudge the forces of history to favor America's national security interests. That's what he understood about the, about the, the Russians and the Chinese and he was one of the early people to get that that they were joined in the hip against us, but as he believed, if you could split them apart, and that's why he went to Beijing, if you could split them apart, the, the Russian system would eventually collapse on its own. They simply could not sustain the communist system as it was then built. Um, and the Chinese were extraordinarily entrepreneurial by nature, and communism would fade as a force. So if you split them apart, the United States would be quite safe, and that's why he went to China, as I say, and I think it made a big, big difference. And now, where he learned to do that, um, you know, I think people, that bright side of Nixon, he, uh, uh, he was a voracious reader, and I'm a big believer in that, the, the curious mind. One of the reasons George W. Bush had trouble as president was he wasn't curious. He was a very nice man, but he wasn't innately curious. You know, if you, if you come to the presidency and sort of you know, in adulthood, and you've had all this discretionary income, and you've never, and you've only been to three countries in your entire life, that suggests a certain lack of curiosity about the world, right? I mean, he'd never been to London, he'd never been to Berlin, he'd never been to Paris, never been to Moscow. And so questions came to him were sort of questions of first impression. Whereas Nixon had traveled everywhere, and he had read everything, so that uh, it, it, he had this curious mind. He and Kissinger would have these debates about who were the best generals in World War I? Uh, now, I, let, me, let me put it a different way about the, uh, let me go to another president, Harry Truman. Uh, he's one of my favorite presidents. Harry Truman was the only president in the 20th century, never, never went to college. He was, when he came out, his family had hit hard times. They didn't have the money and he had to, he, he couldn't go. And he wound up working for seven years on the family farm behind a mule You'd think he'd never amount to anything, but he used all that time when he was on the farm to become self-educated. And he was one of the best educated presidents we ever had. Um, he literally, if there's a book out about it by Harry Truman, which he essentially dictated about American history. Uh, he just, he was a really, really bright man. So I was out in uh, Independence, uh, Missouri, where his library is, gorgeous library, really small, modest, humble library. And uh, there, I got a copy of a, of, of a something he said to high school students, he used to visit him all the time. And he said, not every reader is a leader, but every leader is a reader. And I believe that. So that's what I first saw of Nixon, the bright side. But as I got closer in, he dropped the veil and would let me see him as he really was. And there you saw this dark, roiling, angry, 
just resentful figure. And it was like, whoa, there's a lot of darkness in there. And he had demons inside him that he had never learned to control. And it left him vulnerable because that's what brought him down. I mean, he, <clears throat> he later on had an interview after he left. He later on had an interview with David Frost. And Frost asked him, well, what happened to Watergate? And why, why were you forced out? And he said, I gave my enemies a sword. And then they ran me through. And that's what happened. And so I, and, and in a minor way, you see that with Bill Clinton. I think it's unfair to put them in the same sentence. But Clinton was the brightest guy I've seen in public life since Nixon. Very different kind of luminous intelligence. Uh, he is an unbelievably voracious reader. He reminds you of Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt used to read a book a day at the White House. Book a day. Um, and uh, Bill Clinton loved to read. I first met him when he was governor 10 years before he became president. And, and I went to work for him. But he was, uh, and he was, he was reading about Japanese quality circles. I mean, every day I talked to him, he was talking about something else he was reading. And, and uh, he had a capacity. He had the, this sort of dual capacity to be. So you, I had this experience with him in the Oval Office, as did a number of others. You'd be engaged in a small conversation in the Oval Office, and, you, and he'd be talking, and then you'd be responding to what he said. And while you were talking, and he was listening, he would also be filling out a New York Times crossword puzzle. And so you'd say something about someone, there's some storm about to hit Tampa, and he'd look up and say, who is that character in the second act of Aida? And like, well, I found that daunting. Because uh, I used to have to go, you know, I need to go off in a dark corner with a New York Times crossword puzzle. Uh, uh, actually, I found it insulting. But, the, um, uh, but there it was. And uh, he was, I, I, he, we'd have cabinet members come into cabinet. This is no joke, but he, cabinet member come into cabinet from, say, Department of Housing and Urban Development. He would know more about what was going on in the department and what the policy issues were in the department and what the debates were in the department than the cabinet officer did. And he did that about all of it. It was really, it was phenomenally interesting. He still, to me, I think he was the last good president, I mean, really effective president we've had. That's not a good, but effective. Um, and, uh, but when he came to Washington, he, he still had cracks in his character that he hadn't really, he was working hard at it, and he hadn't quite gotten under control uh, in his marriage, in his personal life, and that sort of thing. And he knew, and he was working at it. Uh, but it didn't, he wasn't quite there. He is there, I think, much more today. He is a much more complete, mature human being today, I believe, and I have great regard for him. And one of the people who helped him, by the way, was Nelson Mandela. Um, yeah, when, Mandela he, when, when, when Clinton went through a lot of his troubles, it was Mandela who really came and counseled him about if you're in trouble, you know, you're, your people can take a lot of things away from you when you're in trouble. Even when he, Mandela was in jail, they, you know, they, 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 they took a lot of his life away from him and everything like that. But he said they can't capture your soul. You have to retain something that you... And that's what Clinton did to get through things. As I say, I think he's, I, I consider him a very admirable yeah. public leader today. So I, I wanna follow up on the, sure. the Nixon-Clinton comparison. Sure. And one of the comparisons that, that you make that, that you felt they shared is that they both desperately wanted to be president and that, that they were not going to be personally fulfilled unless they could be president. And then you compare them to Gerald Ford who you said is one of the most decent presidents we've ever had, and, and maybe with underrated intelligence yeah. as well. And the thing about Gerald Ford was he never wanted to be president. He, he never expected to be president. Is there something about our system that drives forward these people who, who are, ha have this flaw of it's not about leadership for the country, it's about making themselves feel better. It's a good point. Look, uh, I, I was making the argument about drive. And I do believe a person needs to be a good leader, needs to be ambitious. If you, you, you think of Lincoln, 
as a very hum we all think of him as a very humble man. But after he died, Billy Herndon, who was his law partner, said of Lincoln, his, his, his ambition was a little engine that knew no rest. A little engine knew no rest. He was extraordinarily ambitious, wanted to leave his footprints on the sands of time. And, and, there, and he had a, went through a very bleak period in the 1850s after he came home from Congress, only served one term, when he never thought he would amount to very much. And then uh, the, the Kansas Nebraska Act, a whole lot of things got him back into politics. But good leaders are ambitious. You know, uh, Gandhi, you know, who worked for years in South Africa to get rid of the British colonial rule and then came back to India and, and worked at, uh, with great fervor and great success to end colonial rule there. British colonial rule. So when he was asked, well, why did you go to law school in London? And his one word answer was ambition. So and we, we think of ambition as being sort of a, you know, we have a lot of ambivalence about the idea of ambition. I would just say the ambition is a good thing. The question is ambition for what? If it's ambition for self, you're gonna get in a lot of trouble. If that's what you really care about, is just getting yourself moved up and up and up and the adulation that comes from power and influence and all the rest, you're gonna eventually get into a lot of trouble. I think if it's ambition for a group, for a cause, for an organization, that's what becomes really, really important. And that's what is, leads to a very satisfying life. If you look at George Washington, what you'll find is in his early years, and this is true of most great leaders, in their early years, people are very ambitious for self. You know, they're just, they're coming to grips with who they are, and they want to be at the top. And George Washington was, you know, hugely aggressive in, in acquiring land, uh, because he came from a middle class, didn't come from the top of the patriarchy in Virginia, but he wanted more land to distinguish himself. He wanted rank in the military to distinguish himself, went way out of his way to get that. But when he started leading people in conflict, in the, in the forest and everything like that, he became attached to his troops. And he became, the, what he was ambitious for was his group, his troops. And then he became ambitious for the Republic. You know, he was the Cincinnatus, the man called from the, from the plow uh, to defend the Republic. And the most important thing that Washington did for us, because he was not ambitious for self, the most important thing, the most important contribution he made to America was to give up power voluntarily. He gave up power. When, when, when King George III heard that he was gonna resign from the army and not become a dictator of, the, of, the, of America, the king said he will become the most popular and admired man in the world. Not in 150 years had a leader, a military leader, given up power uh, voluntarily. And Washington gave it up when he was head of the army and then he gave up the presidency. Think how different America would be if he just wanted the presidency for life. But it was because he stepped down, he made an enormous gift to the country. Enormous gift. It's often thought that if Washington had had a son, it had been, the, the future would have been much more problematic because there would have been a lot of pressure to make sure his son took the presidency. And we would have been into sort of the monarchical kind of thing. I mean, it raises the questions now about you know families who are, well, with the Clinton family or the Bush family, all the rest, they're, they're harder questions today, but the, the giving up of power was by Washington was about the success of the Republic. And that's what he cared about, and that's why he so admired it. What Lincoln cared about was the union. It wasn't about him. Um, and so I, I do think that Nixon was mostly about him at the time. It, he needed it somehow to feed something in his ego or his sense of self. The contrast to me well, is not is, is in terms of modern presence is actually Reagan. That's the best contrast. Because Reagan really did not care. I mean, he wanted to be president, but he felt his life would be complete if he weren't president. He didn't need to be president to prove himself. He'd already done that. He had done the things he set out to do, and it was a very happy camper. And I think he was by far and away the most comfortable leader we've had in the office over the last 30, 40 years, and arguably the best president, the most effective president as a leader, you can disagree with his policies, and I'm sure some of you do. Um, but if you look at leaders, it, it's often thought 
that Washington, Lincoln, Roosevelt were the best, and I think they were the best. But since Roosevelt, we've had Truman, who was a really good leader. I think Eisenhower, who is now getting much, much higher praise than he used to. Kennedy was uh, uh, absolutely inspirational. He didn't achieve very much as president, partly because his life was cut so awful short. Um, but Reagan, I think, is right up there among those in the last 50 years who is, 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 is one of the better presidents, one of the better leaders as president. Uh, and I think that had a lot to do with his, um, with his temperament. Yeah. So I know you have you have very warm feelings towards Reagan because his ambitions yeah, were, for the, were, well, were for the were for the country. Yeah. Now, you you make a lot of comparisons between Carter and Reagan, and I think Carter probably could make the same arguments that his ambitions were for the country. It was, um, but they were very different people. Uh, Carter, very high IQ. Reagan, very high emotional intelligence both felt the country was not fulfilling its aspirations. Why is it that as a leader, when Carter would, would talk about this crisis of confidence, all he managed to do was depress people, but when Reagan would talk about how we could be doing so much more, he was inspiring people. What, what That's was a really the, interesting point. I, I, I do think you have to uh, lift people's sights. Uh, even now, you know, the country is pretty, you know, this is a very demoralized country right now. Yeah, one of the things, one of the ways we presidents measure how the mood of the country is, is a question that's asked in polling or, uh, of, of the electorate or the public, is the country on the right track or the wrong track? And typically in America, we're very optimistic people in that we've been on the right track most of the time. For the last 10 years, there hasn't been a single poll that finds us on the right track. It's the longest period of time. It's unprecedented. And, and so people are sort of down in the dumps about Washington. I think we have reason to be down in the dumps about Washington. But the leader's role is to see if we can lift our sights again. And in Carter's case, Carter had, Carter had the, there's no question he was bright, man of character. And I think he had the drive, but there was something else. There are this, this character, this personality issue, it does rotate partly around temperament. And Carter was not cut out to be president. It's hard to succeed in politics as a leader if you don't like politicians. It's just sort of hard to do that. You know, you're not going to succeed as a CEO if you don't like business. If you're not into it, maybe you ought to find another line of work. Carter was cut out to be a saint. He's a wonderful saint. He's a wonderful human being. He just was not happy being president. I mean, he didn't like dealing with them. You know, he looked down his nose at the politicians and, and, and it made a difference. You know, when Tip O'Neill got, you know, when they gave him seats to the inaugural and they were out someplace in East Jesus, you know, he never forgave the Carter people for that and they just didn't treat him right. Uh, get a quick example. There used to be a, a, a boat called the Sequoia, presidential yacht. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a fancy yacht, but it was a fairly big boat. It was tied up down at the naval shipyard in, in Washington. And, and, and presidents, for many, many years, would call up members of Congress and say, why don't we have dinner next Wednesday night? You bring whoever, and uh, we'll go out on, on, on the Potomac. And we'll have three or four hours out there, and there'd be a lot of drinking, and be a dinner. Best thing was, you could, they couldn't get off the boat. So the president had a chance to really, you know, hop, you know, to spend time with them and do a lot of social stuff. And it was a great asset to be president. It was one of those things that really made it, um, it, it, you could create these kind of bonds with people because you're out there doing that. Carter comes to town, says, I, we need to save money. What did he do? He sold the boat. <laughs> he sold the boat for a song. It was like, <laughs> you know, don't you understand? Uh, and and, and there's, there, I don't want to go too far with this. I have great respect for President Obama. Uh, as a human being, I think he's first class. Uh, and he's really bright. I've, I've had a chance to spend time with him. He's really bright. And he really wants to do well by the country. But he doesn't particularly like politics either. And he doesn't particularly like politicians. And it shows. I mean, they, he doesn't have a lot of friends in the Congress. And he doesn't have a lot of friends who are heads of state in other countries. And it makes a difference when you're trying to mobilize a group or team or whatever. Let me give you an example. 
He likes to play golf. Golf is, uh, some of you play golf, more of you play 20 years from now. Uh, golf is a very social sport. It's a good time. Christopher and I played nine holes this morning. Yeah, it was great. We had a good time. We had a great time together. Uh, and uh, so President Obama played 103 rounds of golf in the first term. That's 103 opportunities to ask members of Congress to come out and play with you or other people to come out and play with you. You know how many times he asked members of Congress? How many members of Congress he asked to come out? One Democrat and one Republican and 103 rounds. That, to me, like, like a missed opportunity. I, I can just tell you stories about, uh, uh, for all of the faults of George W. Bush and, and going recklessly into Iraq was surely one of the biggest. But he did have good relations with a number of countries, with rulers of a number of countries, because he would regularly invite them to come up and spend a weekend at Camp David. And it was a social thing. They had dinner together. You spent time together. You go walking in the woods together. You, you spend that time together. And, uh, you, you, they, they just don't get invited up to Camp David right now. And I think that's just... It's a, yeah, I, I can guarantee you, whether it's Hillary or somebody else next time around, that's going to change. Yeah. Change. So, so you answered my question about Obama, and now I want to ask about, uh, about the Clintons. So you, you moved into the Clinton White House, yeah. and at first you, you, you answered the call of, uh, of duty to, to serve the president. Well, it was and, honored when he called. And, and at we first, had a big debate. Christopher will remember. We had a big debate in the House. Christopher was all for it. My wife was uh, not exactly ecstatic. I, uh, I, I don't know, I saw Bob Gates the other day, he's a former defense secretary, and he's, he's got a broken neck, he's got this great big brace around his neck. And I said, what happened? And he said, well, I was having breakfast with my wife, and, uh, and we were, they live up in Seattle, and he said, uh, honey, I'm thinking about going back into government. And, and she, he said, next thing I knew, I was in the hospital with a broken neck. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, you, you um, <laughs> never know what you're going to get. Uh, right. <laughs> the, uh, so the, the time, I guess, uh, at, at first was, was productive, but over with time the you, with the Clintons, yeah. but over time you felt like you were uh, less, less helpful than you would like to be in that role. Yeah. And, and part of what you chronicle is that you, you had different views than Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm particularly around the, uh, the, the push around health care reform. Mm -hmm. My question is that do you think that having, having gone through a number of things since Bill Clinton was president in terms of her experience set and the qualities that you saw then when she was not president, do you feel like those qualities are going to make her a good president and do you think she will be the next president? I don't know, but uh, about the last part of it, uh, let me say this. Uh, uh, we did, uh, when I first went in the White House, and uh, I, I, I went to the Clinton White House about six months in, they, he was floundering a little bit. He couldn't quite find his footing. And he asked me, and then I went to see Hillary independently to say, I'm not doing this unless you want to do this, because I didn't think it was worthwhile. And she said, no, let's do it. Um, and we did find uh, that I had different, you know, they'd asked me to come in and help them with Washington and sort of see if they could get back to the middle. And most importantly, he'd lost his self-confidence and he, he regained it and I give him enormous credit for that. Um, but I did find I disagreed with her. In fact, about, we disagreed on about every three issues, we disagreed on five of them. And, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, and we disagreed on health care. I thought the proposal that they had uh, was uh, too much government and too far to the left to get, to get passage. And that we, uh, I thought we could get a bill um, and that would be a compromise bill that would have advanced us on health care a long way. And that opportunity slipped away. But that, be that as it may, they tried very hard, but I do, I came away with a very, very high regard for her as a person and an even higher regard for her as a fighter for what she believes in, for social justice, as she defines it. And she, she, is a, she fights for her causes. Since then, I've become more impressed with her. I think that she is a woman with enormous resilience 
And I think that's important in a leader today, in anything you do. And you read now about a lot of it, the resilience of a group, the resilience of a nation. The, you know, the Harvard Business Review has got a great big you know, cover package out in the last month or so about the resilient company. Uh, because we live in such volatile times uh, that companies are bound to go up and down. And, but that happens to individuals too. This whole thing that you know, they teach at the military academy now about uh, at West Point, and they have what's called VUCA to describe V-U-C-A, to describe the environment in which we all find ourselves now, and it stands for volatility, uncertainty, chaos, and ambivalence, VUCA. And that's the world we live in, and she has navigated that as well as anybody I have met. She has an enormous capacity, to, as I say, the resilience to get, she gets up when she's knocked down, and she is able to reinvent herself. Uh, and that is a capacity that I think is also necessary in today's world in your generation. So, uh, uh, and the other thing I admire about her is when she first came to Washington, I thought she, her husband was supremely attuned to politics. He had just one of these ears for politics, uh, sort of a perfect ear, just like Blair had in the early days in, in, in the UK. But she was not, she had what we call a tin ear in politics. I mean, she didn't quite get the vibes and what was being said to her and she was not very effective. She's much, much better at that now. She's really educated. And I think that people say, well, can't we, you know, hasn't she been around too long? Don't we need a newcomer? Well, you know something, there's a lot to be said for experience. Um, and she's had the experience, she's had the blows. Um, she knows a lot more about how to organize a team. She had problems with that at one time in her life. Uh, I think she's shown us some vulnerability. Uh, I think she is running. I think she's already running. Uh, and the only real question is, is she going to stop running? Will she choose to stop running? And I think that would be based on her health. And I don't know the answer to that, only she knows or her doctor knows. Uh, I hope that she's in great health. Uh, it, it's possible that she would decide that, well, you know, I am of an age and I'm tired and maybe you need to be younger to do this job. I know. I, I, I know women who are very, very close to her, personally and, and same age, who, who are urging you don't do this. Because you're gonna find it, it's a job that's 24 seven, as you well know, and look what, how, how hard it was to fly all over the world as Secretary of State, and you shouldn't do it. I, I hope none of those things holds her back. Will she get elected? I don't know. If she runs and if she you know, gets the nomination, she's gonna be tough to beat. Um, uh, a lot depends on who, if the Republicans have a candidate who is, you know, is a viable candidate. I don't know whether, you know, by my lights, Jeb Bush, it, it, I thought there were two people that could potentially get the nomination and potentially be uh, uh, competitive. And one was Chris Christie, and, and, you know, you learn that you don't, the, the road to the White House is not through a block bridge on, uh, you know, in New York. Uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, and so Jeb is the sort of person potentially standing, and I have gotten to know Jeb. Christopher and I have gotten to know him a little bit over the years now, and uh, I've come away with a much higher, f you know, I think he's a very substantial human being. And, and frankly, if, uh, I would be very comfortable if the presidency were in the hands of either Hillary or Jeb, just in terms of having a stable, thoughtful, sensible, closer to the center kind of president, which is what I think we need to build bridges across this crazy divide we have in our politics, you know, and we need somebody who's willing to, is tough enough and, 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 and has enough courage uh, to build the bridges, because we, we're never gonna get our stuff. I mean, yeah. it's not that our politics are meaner than they used to be, it's worth remembering way back in the early days of the Republic that we had a former vice president who shot and killed a former secretary of the treasury. Politics were pretty mean back then too. What the difference is that back then they were actually, even though they had their rivalries, they got things done, they got problems solved. What's happening now is we're not solving problems as we go. And, so, and that's leave, and we need a president, frankly, who can do that. We desperately need that president. So, so let me follow up on that. And the, the, the word that we use a lot in describing some of those issues is partisanship. Yeah. And uh, kind of interesting fact that when you first interviewed for the, uh, the job was in, in the Nixon White House, you informed your interviewer that you had voted for Humphrey instead of Nixon. Um, always a good job hunting tip uh, to... Um, and, and then, of course, 
Nixon had uh, had Moynihan uh, did. as a as a key advisor, uh, but but fast forward to today and listen to uh, Governor Huntsman talk about how he feels ostracized by his own party because he accepted an ambassadorship under Obama. I know, it's crazy. So, so what, what has happened to the idea of service to your country instead of service to your party? And how, how can we get the kind of leadership we need to advance the common good? It's not a lost cause. It's a cause that has faded some, but it's really up to your generation. I have a lot of faith in you guys rejecting the politics of today. I cannot believe you're gonna let this nonsense continue. And what I find among them, the, the best among you in your generation is that you wanna move on and create a new politics. And you create a new sense of community, a new sense of service, you know, and you bring a lot of innovation. And uh, I, I'm a big believer in the social entrepreneurship movement. And, and, and I think all of us, by the way, uh, you know, more in the loss of Greg Dees. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to know him while, you were, while he was here on the faculty. Uh, but I can tell you in the social entrepreneurship community, I went to a gathering in California this summer, about 350 social entrepreneurs from around the country, and there was a long pause the first night to, to remember Greg Dees. He was a very fine individual here at this university, uh, and well beyond. Um, but the question of, we did have for a long time a noble tradition of people being willing to work for each other uh, in, for common good, and people could be appointed to positions uh, across the aisle and work there. When Franklin, when the war was approaching, it was very, very important that Franklin Roosevelt reached out and got two Republicans to serve as Secretary of War and Secretary of the Navy. It was very, very important at that time. Um, and as recently as John Kennedy, when John Kennedy was first elected and he was young and seen as callow and inexperienced and inspirational, but people were a little worried about whether he would be a mature, have a mature hand on the wheel. And what did Kennedy do? He reached out during his transition and asked and got a Republican to serve as Secretary of the Treasury. He had a Republican serve as Secretary of Defense he had a Republican serve as secretary of, as the head of the CIA, and he asked a Republican from a university to come and be his national security advisor at the White House. Now, what had he done? He'd taken the two sort of like critical things the president has to do that the markets get really rattled about. Is national security in good hands? Is the economy in good hands in Washington? If you get one of those two things wrong, you can get really get a lot of nervousness, right, in the markets and business. And he got them both right by putting people there from across the aisle. And that's the spirit in which I went to work for Clinton. I believe in that tradition. I think, I think it's an important tradition. Um, I, one of the reasons I admire Bob Gates so, as much as I do, and I think he's one of the finest public servants of our time, uh, is that he worked for a Republican president as Secretary of Defense. And then President Obama, I thought, and good for him, asked Bob Gates to stay as his Secretary of Defense, so he worked for a Democratic. Uh, president, and you know that, but that tradition is now largely disappeared. It's been, and you do take a lot of risks, as Huntsman has found out. Uh, and as as Jeb, look at Jeb, just has been saying the last two or three days, is he's been thinking about running. For, he's now thinking about running for the nomination, and he's had a bunch of people from the conservative side pile all over him because. He didn't take a hardline stance against immigration in the last couple of days. He said, you know, we have to be respectful of why a lot of people have come here uh, across the border. It's often an act of trying to reunite with their families. It's an act of love. And people are just like, you know, uh, that is, the, the Republican Party is, is, will never become a majority party again unless it's willing to, to have a bigger tent. Uh, and I think the Democrat. I think there's some fear in the Democratic Party. If De Blasio represents the future of the Democratic Party, you know you're going to have the Tea Party on the left. Uh, uh, so you know, so on both sides, there's a danger. I think of going to more extreme. So uh, I, I'm going to ask one more question, and sure. uh, then I want to turn it over to the audience. Okay. The so the this partisanship seems to have gotten even worse, which it, it's now within parties. You have this this factionalization. 
and uh, and things are just getting getting worse and worse in terms of the ability to to build bridges. There's there's someone by the name of uh, Ken Gergen, who uh, I think you are familiar with, who who coined a, a concept um, deficit discourse. And we talk we talk about a lot about a deficit of leadership, and um, but but Ken Gergen's notion was that by focusing on deficits in society that we actually suppress the positive possibilities. And so is that, is that what has gone wrong in politics, is that we spend so much time hating on each other that you don't do this, you don't do that, that we're suppressing those That's positive possibilities. Just, uh, just to fill in the blanks here, um, uh, Ken is my older brother, one of my older brothers, and a very dear friend. And uh, he had taught for many years at Swarthmore, and guess where your dean went and did his undergraduate work? <laughs> so, uh, I, and, and he wasn't misled by my brother. He could have led you down a garden path, but so you, you resisted that, that, sound, that cry from him. My brother's been an iconoclast uh, most of his life. Um, and, um, it, 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 this, this deficit disorder goes to an issue in psychology that for a long time psychology asked, tried to analyze in, in, psych, in psychiatry, what's wrong with people? And how do we, they assume we're looking for what they're missing and we'll, fill in the, we'll try to fill that in, either through therapy or drugs or whatever. And more recently there's been something called positive psychology that has developed and that is, can you look for the strengths in people and or can you become uh, as uh, uh, can you become can you become a can you learn optimism? And there, there's the literature now that that's out there. And my brother Ken and his wife have a, a, a newsletter. They call it Positive Aging Newsletter. But, and that is how do you look at the more positive side of life? Because it actually does make you feel more cheerful and brighter and more hopeful than if you're always, you know, the rain, it's always raining on your head. Uh, and, you know, frankly, I think if you have people who are always into the deficit side and go around and, uh, and are always focusing on what's wrong, they make terrible leaders. Uh, because they're always, you know, woe is me, the world is falling apart. What we are looking for are people who have some sense of hope and how the hell do we get out of this mess? We, we know how we got into the ditch, how do we get out? Um, uh, and you need that in, uh, President Eisenhower, who was a fantastic leader in the war, um, used to say he always confined his troubles to his pillow. He confined his troubles to his pillow. And that your role is, you know, even when the bleakest days, he wanted to make, you know, he wasn't Pollyannish about it. He just wanted to give people a sense of, Let's just, let's just buckle down, let's just keep going, we're gonna make it out of here. And that's how we got through the war in some ways. We came very close to losing, as you know. Um, so, you know, Ken does have this notion about we can take a more positive view. And I think that's the way, if you look at, uh, I, t I teach a leadership class at the Kennedy School. And uh, one of the most popular sessions that we have together is on uh, how to handle defeat, how to handle, you know, when you go down. Um, and, because all of us have defeats in life, you're gonna have defeats, you, you know. To getting here, you probably have had lives mostly of, you know, of great triumph, but there's gonna come a time, and just inevitably, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna take a fall. And it goes back to this resilience question, but it also goes back to sort of how do you, how do you, uh, I think people need a lot of stoicism. I, I think you do need to knew, know about Epictetus. You do need to know about the Stoics and what, what, uh, what influence Epictetus had. Um, Marcus Aurelius, for example, if you, it's good to be able to read Marcus Aurelius from time to time in meditations uh, because they help you understand how to deal with, with tragedy, hardship, failure, defeat. Um, but it is also a question of being willing to try to see if there's some bright, uh, shining uh, rim on a cloud of darkness. And uh, I, I just, you, 
it's really willing, worthwhile to read Mandela's life and read one of his biographies. Or there, there are various books out now about Mandela, but one by Samson, Anthony Sampson, uh, is I think one of the best, or his, his own personal memoirs. But how Mandela could deal with you know, his years in jail um, and what he had to go through. And one of the things he did was um, that, he, that he decided to understand his jailers. His jailers were the, uh, the, these, these Dutch guys. And he got books out about their history and tried to understand who they were and why they believed such strange things as they did. And he started, and so he began talking to his jailers in a much more sympathetic, empathic way, not sympathetic, empathic, trying to understand what they'd walk, their, their, what, what, how they'd walk through life. And uh, it, made a, it made a big difference. Eventually he became the leaders of his jailers. They looked to him as their, as their leader. And when he, was, you know, when he was freed and then he became elected at his inauguration, he had his former jailers on the front row at his inauguration. Now that requires a certain kind of positive light within a person. Um, and he also, um, you know, Mandela was, you know, he, he ran something called Mandela University at, at, on Robben Island, that, where he tried to teach the other ANC uh, prisoners. Uh, and they, 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 they read literature together. And you know, a couple of them said that he used to come around um, and recite poetry to them. And one of the po poems he loved to recite was called Invictus. Invictus, it's a Latin for courage. And it was written by a fellow named Henley back, it was a Victorian poem, you're probably familiar with it. But it's a, it, was, it was memorized by generations in, in the UK for a long time and, and Mandela uh, memorized it. Um, and in the last verse of it goes, I hope I get this right, it matters not how straight the gate, that's how straight the path to heaven is, nor marked with punishments the scroll, you know, what you have to present at the pearly gates and what kind of things you've done. It matters not how straight the gate nor marked with punishments the scroll, for I am the captain of my fate, I am the master of my soul. He retained that sense. They can't take that from you. You have something you can call you. And that's really important to covet, to, to develop, to hold, uh, and then to have this sense of community, but understand that things may come at you and you just, that, that goes back to Epictetus, that goes back to the Stoicism. What, what any one of us can do is we, can, we, can, we should take responsibility for what we can do but if things happen outside our place of control, then that's life, and you just have to deal with it. And it may be negative, it may be positive, but you've got to learn how to deal with it and accept it philosophically because you can't change it. Don't worry about it a lot. Just go and try to change what you can. And that's what I think the best leaders do. I think they have this sense, okay, things, things took a bad turn. Maybe now we can do something else we never thought we could do. Maybe there's some here, something here. Maybe this gives us an opportunity. Get over your anger and, and your frustration. Uh, you know, we used to have a preacher at Harvard, Peter Gomes, who was no longer with us, a wonderful man, African-American. Uh, wonderfully interesting. He was black, gay, and a Republican. Uh, and he officiated at Reagan's second inaugural. Um, uh, but, uh, but Peter used to say about adversity, uh, get used to it, get over it, and get on with it. Thanks, good advice. Okay, so that's, uh, that, that's great advice. And on that note, I don't know if, if anyone wants to jump in after that. Um, <laughs> but uh, are there any questions? There's a fellow up here. Yes, oh, you got a mic coming? We won't keep you much longer. Good afternoon. My name is Bahari Harris, and I'm a uh, first-year MPP MBA student. What um, was the first part of that? 
Bahari Harris. Yeah, you're. I'm yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. A master of public policy over oh, you at the got, You're in a school. joint degree program. Yes, yes, Good sir. Good for you. I, yeah. think, I, I think the world of that program. Thank you, thank you. Um, I've really appreciated your remarks today, and I've always really admired your wisdom um, and your commentary on TV. Um, I also appreciated your perspective on President Obama. And given your history growing up in the racialized South, how much of a role do you think that racism has played in Obama's isolation in politics? And more specifically, wouldn't you agree that um, he is the first president to ever really have had his very identity and his legitimacy as a person questioned, not only his, um, his ideas and his policies. Uh, you know, it's an interesting. I, I believe that you will find that in the African-American community, there's a very strong sense that his race has played a significant role in a criticism, often unfair and often very personal that has come to him. Uh, and in a white community, I think there's less of a sense of that. People think, well, he's, you know, what, what, what did race have to do with the rollout of Obamacare? Uh, you know, it wasn't that much more about technical questions than it was about race. Uh, and so I think we're always gonna have disagreements about that. Do I think race has played a role in his politics and his capacity to govern? Absolutely. Um, I think to, uh, there, was a, there was a degree when he first ran, and I think when he re ran again in 2012, when race was actually a positive factor for him among the young. Uh, just as I think Hillary Clinton's gender will be a positive for her should she run. Um, but it's also true that the white disapproval of Obama has been considerably higher than the black disapproval for, since he's been in office, and it's widened here and, and in the last couple of years. And I do think that there, there, are, in, there are definitely places in America where, it's, uh, where racism still is an issue. I mean, still persists. Uh, I would like to think that, you know, the president has not, in his first term, didn't really talk, didn't, didn't want to be seen as the black president. And, uh, and wanted to be president of all the people. I think that was an admirable and right thing to do. I have been pleased by the degree to which he's now in the second term moving away toward, and he started, set up this new program called My Brother's Keeper uh, to help uh, focus on boys and young men of color, especially African American. Uh, I had the opportunity this past Sunday to spend it with uh, Joshua Du Bois. I don't know if you know Joshua. He was a pastor, he's African American, young man who uh, was in effect chief spiritual advisor to President, has been chief spiritual advisor for President Obama, every day sends him a devotional. And uh, Joshua made a very compelling argument that Americans do not fully, uh, white America does not fully understand the history of the country the way it's seen by many in the black community. And that is not only were there 250 years of slavery but that was followed by 50 years of Jim Crow, and that was followed by another 50 years of a variety of, uh, of uh, policies that in effect uh, uh, marginalized or uh, left a lot of African-American males in, uh, on the margins. And that even the, even the crackdown on crime, especially on drugs in the last 20 to 30 years, has, you know, has been seen in the black community as a form of social control. Uh, that, do you know the number of people incarcerated? The number of black males incarcerated today is greater than the number of people who were slaves in 1850. That's a pretty heavy deal. And a white American, I, I confess I didn't know that. Uh, you know, so there's a certain amount of anger and resentment about that, but I think it's being translated into something very positive now with President Obama with this emphasis he's now putting on, on, on trying to work with young boys and, uh, and young men uh, of African-American descent and to see if we can deal with this because it's a huge, huge problem for the country that needs to be addressed. And my sense is that like Jimmy Carter, who went off and did wonderful things for the world, after he left the presidency, and as Bill Clinton has done, 
through the Clinton Global Initiative, done a lot of good things for the world. My sense is that that's the direction that President Obama may well take in his post-presidential years, and I, and, and I would salute him for that. It's something that we need to get. We just haven't made the progress we need to make uh, in advancing opportunities. I'm worried, if anything, I must tell you, I, I have some fear that the, that the African American community is about to be left behind again, not only by the income inequalities that we're seeing um, and the wealth inequalities that we're seeing, uh, but with the coming of new, you know, um, robots and artificial intelligence and all these other things that are, that's going to destroy some jobs, that a lot of people are going to who are going to lose their jobs are going to be African Americans. And I, I sense anecdotally that we're beginning to see signs in the Latino community that is picking up traction. That the Latino community is starting to move, especially Latinas. Uh, to, you see more and more Latinas now who are stepping up, who are really very impressive and are moving ahead. And we dare not get in a situation where Latinas move way ahead, or Latinos move way ahead, and the African American community does not move up. We have to have equal opportunity, and we have to realize your generation, the millennial generation, biggest generation in American history, is, is the biggest minority generation in American history, too. It's 40% minority. And we, not, we have to, as a country, ensure that there's a pipeline of talent and well-prepared people from the black community and the Latino community and the positions of power and influence in this country. It's really, really important for our future. Uh, and, I, and I'm glad to see so many, you know, so much diversity in this, this audience. It speaks well of the, of the business school, and uh, in particular, and well of Duke, too, that there's as much diversity. I appreciate your question. I'm really glad you got the public policy degree along with your other degree. That's good. Thank you. David, I think that we need to, uh, yeah, we need you to wrap up. up. We're, we're actually here, over here, 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 so. here. Honduras? That's right. Honduras, all right. See, here we go. <laughs> you want to get us out of here, don't you? Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for your flexibility. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of Dean Boulding and the Fuqua School of Business, we'd like to present you with uh, oh, thank a small you. token. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you very much. Guys. Thank you.